Hi guys, I know it's lunchtime. I'm glad I'm at the head of the pack. Dr. Ogi gets to catch you after you already started digesting. <laughs> can you hear me in the back? Okay, anyway, I'll assume you can unless you say otherwise. All right, acute renal failure, otherwise known as AKI or acute kidney injury. Um, this is something that all of you are gonna see, whether in the community or in the hospital. About 1% of the general population develop AKI. In the hospital, you can see this anywhere from two to 7% of all hospitalizations across different wards. And uh, there's been lots of actually data in the past 10, 15 years about acute renal failure, outcomes, survival, and in the past five to seven years, more data on long-term outcomes. Um, so even though we've learned a lot more about acute kidney failure, we've improved our supportive technologies, we've improved our dialysis therapies, we haven't made very much difference in terms of mortality and survival in patients that come out with acute renal failure. Um, in fact, if you have a severe episode of acute renal failure requiring dialysis, the mortality rate over many large studies is about 47 to 50 percent. So it's a big problem. And uh, if you have an episode of acute renal failure and you progress to chronic kidney disease, um, again, there's not very much treatment except for dialysis and kidney transplant. Okay. All right. So, so where are we now in regards to acute kidney injury? Uh, we've had lots and lots of different studies. We've discussed this many times. Um, we, are, we have now better criteria in which to standardize and measure different degrees of acute kidney injury. We still don't have very good measures to combat acute kidney injury or to treat acute kidney injury. Um, so at this point, supportive preventative therapies still need to be very highly focused upon. Um, and this should be a focus when the patient comes into the hospital for the generalist or whoever is on the ward in terms of assessing the patient when they come in for their risk of acute kidney injury and prophylaxing them and appropriately managing medications. And again, as a reminder also, after the acute kidney injury in that recovery phase, we often see re-injury and that can be a risk factor for progression to chronic kidney disease. So management before and after, not just during. Um, we do have a better understanding of the long-term sequelae, and I'll go over that a little bit. And we still desperately need therapies that are effective in terms of preventing and treating acute kidney injury. Okay, so one of the things that we tried to do was standardize the way that we look at patients that have kidney injury. And so we came together as a group of critical care doctors and kidney doctors and developed the acute quality, dialysis quality initiative RIFLE criteria, which stands for risk, injury, failure, loss, and ESRD. And it's just a way of classifying the degree of kidney injury. So if you're in the risk category, you had a 50% increase of your creatinine from baseline. Injury, doubling of creatinine from baseline. Failure, meaning that you had 75% drop in your kidney function or your oliguric, severe oliguria. Loss, meaning you had a period of um, complete kidney failure requiring dialysis, and ESRD, obviously, you did not recover and you progressed to chronic kidney disease, okay? So as all good nephrologists are, we always have to argue and debate, and so we argued and debated and decided we wanted to come up with a second set of criteria. And the reason for that being that um, we really wanted to focus on the early part of the rifle, the RIF, because some of the data was showing that even with much milder levels, of kidney injury with less than 50% rise in serum creatinine, we were seeing, seeing bad outcomes. And so we wanted to give our researchers and doctors a way of trying to classify that and look at that in a standardized way. So we came up with the Aiken Diagnostic Criteria for Acute Kidney Injury, class one, two, three, which basically um, you know, complies with rifle one, two, and three, but at earlier stage. Um, so Stage one is about a 0.3 milligram per deciliter increase or increase more than 25% of serum creatinine above baseline. Two would be kind of like rifle RI, RI criteria. And I'm uh, sorry, two and three would be like rifle RI criteria. 
Okay. Okay, so how do we use this now to help us in terms of learning? So there's a lot of studies that have used these different criteria to help define outcomes in kidney failure and acute <coughs> kidney injury. Um, so if we go back and we take a look at a lot of the studies, I'm just giving you some summaries of the major studies that have been done. There have been more than 40, 50 study, different studies uh, of different qualities with different definitions. Um, but in general, if you have a patient in the ICU who has acute kidney injury that's defined by the RIFLE criteria, if you have just risk, no injury, about 5.5% mortality, which is not that much different from patients that don't have acute kidney failure, okay? Um, if you end up with risk, um, about 8.8% mortality. With actual injury, 11.4%, and kidney failure is about 25% overall mortality, okay? And, but in that risk group, if you look later, more than half of those patients that initially fell into the risk category progressed to have actual kidney injury. And even with small rises in creatinine, they saw that there was increases in hospital stay and also long-term um, progression of kidney disease. So this is just uh, showing 60-day mortalities, okay? And you can see if they had failure requiring dialysis at 60 days, about 50% mortality. If they had kidney injury, maybe around 30% mortality. Risk, about 15%. And in general, these are high-risk patients. They have pre-existing risk factors, even a side from CKD. So no kidney injury, 7 to 10%. So you can see that there is a significant association. If you add renal failure, on top of what else is going on of any degree, you have some increase in mortality. And the severity of injury correlates with the degree of increase of mortality. Okay, so just a few things to kind of keep in mind. About 1% of all adults have APN at admission, okay? <coughs> Two to 5% develop APN or AKI. Sometimes it's difficult to separate. I don't think we can. In some studies, they looked at specifically APN. In some studies, it was looking at acute kidney injury, so you could not really separate between ischemic, hypoxic injury, and other types of injury, okay? Um, and in, depending on where you are in the hospital, your, the mortality can be much higher. If you're looking at uh, patients that are in the hospital following cardiac intervention, it's very variable, okay? And I think that depends on the severity of injury the underlying patient demographic and maybe what unit you're in and what type of surgery <coughs> you're having. But in many studies, as high as 30% mortality following cardiac intervention and up to 60% in ICUs, okay? And about 1% to 2% have acute renal failure in the hospital that is severe enough to require uh, renal replacement therapy. Okay. And then in the past five to seven years, we have gotten more long-term data out past the 90 days at six months and one year, what happens to these patients if they survive past that 90-day mark. 15% of them actually ended up developing CKD. And that's compared to the same matched cohorts of patients that were in the ICU with similar risk factors. They only had about 2% if they did not have an episode of AKI, okay? And as we kind of see with the escalating numbers, the highest mortality occurs really in that first 30 days and then in the next 60 days. And the further out you get, the mortality association is less, okay? But some of the numbers, there's a big meta-analysis and they said by six months, your risk of mortality is about 2.59 compared to patients that do not have acute kidney injury. But anywhere from one to five to some studies in specific units greater than seven, okay? Um, they've also shown that AKI can be associated with a higher risk of subsequent MI, possibly because these patients are already at risk. Um, but compared to patients from match cohorts that did not, that had similar risk factors, that did not have AKI, they still had a higher incidence of MI. Um, now, if they had full recovery of their acute kidney injury, their creatinine came back to baseline while they were in the hospital, 
And if you look at these patients long term, their mortality actually is similar to patients who did not have API, which just shows that if we could identify risk factor early, prophylax, and find ways to mitigate acute kidney injury, we could actually really decrease the mortality of these patients. So that's a big area that we need focus on and good young people to do research on. Okay? Um, and if you have a severe episode requiring dialysis compared to patients that have an episode but do not require dialysis, the, <coughs> risk, the progression risk is higher. It's about three times higher risk of progressing to chronic dialysis. Okay? And an interesting finding, actually, that's been reported in across the board in several studies is that this is the opposite of what you would expect, that if you had a lower GFR, meaning you had CKD when you came into the hospital and you had an acute kidney injury episode compared to somebody who had normal creatinine coming in and had the same severity of acute kidney injury, um, the ones that had CKD had a higher rate of recovery. So that's kind of odd, right? Because we think, oh, CKD is a risk factor for acute kidney injury. It is um, a risk factor for acute kidney injury, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the outcome is worse in patients that have CKD. And we don't fully understand that, but it could be that you know, maybe the patients that had CKD that had acute kidney injury, they were more higher percentage of those were kidney-related acute kidney injury versus other reasons for acute kidney injury that might be uh, multifactorial. Or it could be that if you have a patient that already has pre-existing CKD, we tend to focus on them more and to follow them more. And so maybe we're managing them better and therefore they have better outcomes. Okay? We don't know the answer to that question. That needs more studies because obviously we don't want to give our patients CKD to prevent AKI. Okay. And, and also, even though um, they had um, better survival, patients that had pre-existing CKD, they tended to progress more than patients who did not have pre-existing CKD. Okay? So just a quick summary. Most patients do recover, okay? But depending especially on what unit you're in and what your risk factors are, um, a high percentage can progress to early mortality, cardiac mortality, or kidney failure. Oh, sorry, one last thing. Elderly patients across the board are at risk for CKD when you get above age 65, both men and women. The initial studies reported elderly women, especially following cardiac uh, um, intervention, but <coughs> later studies have shown that elderly men also can have high risk of CKD. Okay, um, so recently in the past five years, most of the data we have is collected from patients that are in the hospital that develop acute kidney injury in the hospital or at the time of admission are diagnosed with acute kidney injury. Um, but there has been at least one good study. This was done in the UK in Cardiff. I guess they have one big hospital that has an outpatient lab and an acute assessment ward that serves um, about a, a third of a billion people. And uh, they looked at community-acquired <laughs> acute kidney injury. And they basically found that average age of patients, oh, sorry, this is the pre-existing CKD. So patients that had AKI that happened but was picked up in the hospital or in a lab or an outpatient lab but didn't happen after admission, um, about 37% of those patients had CKD, okay, which is a much higher percent than all patients that are admitted to the hospital. So you can see that CKD is a risk factor for AKI. Um, and then if you looked at the pre-existing CKD versus patients who did not, again, the numbers are similar. All the numbers are really similar to what you see in patients that have AKI that occur in the hospital. So CKD is a risk factor for progression, um, and uh, it does convey higher um, short-term mortality. Uh, sorry. It, it does convey higher mortality compared to patients that don't have AKI, but um, compared to patients that don't have pre-existing CKD, the mortality is actually, survival is better if they have AKI compared to patients that have a similar degree of AKI that do not have pre-existing CKD. So we're seeing that all across the board, even though that was kind of an unexpected finding. I'm gonna skip to the next one, but it just says 
pretty much the same thing with the new media acquired. Okay, so we know AKI is a big problem that we need to address. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about how do you want to approach and manage acute kidney injury. When I get onto the consult boards, I'm like 101 flavors of AKI, and I just want to pick which one I'm going to take and eat it. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so this is, this is my suggestion of how when you've got a patient that has AKI, that you want to approach it. This is what I tell my fellows. Look at the history, get a really good history because you can figure out what is going on most 90% of the time by really looking at the history, okay? And some of this you're gonna be doing simultaneously, okay? Um, figure out what their baseline is and look at the trends in nephrology. <coughs> We're always looking at trends because as we know, creatinine is not a great marker and it can vary from day to day, and so we want to see what is the trend, what is the baseline, okay? Um, assess volume status, urine output, obviously. Is there cardiovascular instability? Because that will be important when you talk to your um, consult so that they know if they need to do re renal replacement therapy, what modality to do. And look for that temporal link. So you're looking at the history, you look through the medications, you look at whether they had cardiovascular instability, when did they have the drop in the urine output, when did they have the rise in the creatinine, and you're gonna look in that one day, two days, three days before that happens to see what risk can you tie in time-wise, okay? And then you might wanna assess some urine indices. Okay, I'm not gonna, this is kind of a very detailed thing, but Fluid therapy adjustments, just remember when you have acute kidney injury, you need to look at what you're giving your patient. If they have a drop in their urine output, you need to concentrate your fluids accordingly. Okay, you might wanna separate out your, rather than giving them maintenance, insensible plus replacement fluids so that if their kidney function and urine output is changing that you can match your patient better. Make sure you take the potassium out of your fluids, okay? And every patient that has acute kidney injury needs to have strict ins and outs and daily weights, okay? That's a big problem, I think, here in the hospital, that, but that should be driven in. Um, and not only just because you're having injury, but because you're monitoring them through the injury and recovery, and so they are gonna be at risk for re-injury, okay? Electrolyte acid-base management. Again, check your schedule medicines. Make sure they're taking off anything scheduled that you don't want them to be on, okay? Um, determine what you think if they have an acid-base deficit. Is it respiratory? Is it metabolic? What do you think the etiology is? Is it something that's ongoing or something that was a single insult that is not ongoing? Because that's gonna affect how you manage that, okay? Dosing. We just had a patient that we got a consult on who came from another hospital. It was an ESRD patient, came in with endocarditis. They were unstable the first day, so we ended up not dialyzing that patient. And for two days, the patient who came with endocarditis that was resistant to medication at the other hospital who had been supposedly set up to get daptomycin did not get their medication because it was scheduled to be given with dialysis and they did not get dialysis. So we really don't want those things to happen, okay? Every day, check your medicines. If there's a change in modality, if you start dialysis, if you change <laughs> the dialysis modality because Dosing is not the same for CRRT as it is for intermittent dialysis, okay? Or if they start to have recovery, you don't want to underdose and you don't want to overdose, okay? Um, and again, you know, ACE inhibitors, NSAIDs, all of what types of antibiotics they've been on, all of that is very useful information. Even when I'm on the renal service, we have patients that come in, kidney transplant, they come in and have acute kidney injury of some reason or the other. Often, the second day I'm scanning through and I see, oh, colchicine on a daily scheduled high dose, you know, and they have acute kidney injury with, you know, their creatinine is a quarter of what used to be. So really, you know, think about these things and go back and look at the medications and make sure they're where you want them to be, okay? Procedural considerations, that's actually quite important, especially when they're like in cardiology or surgery in the ICU, because sometimes they need studies that need contrast. 
and they already have injuries. So the question is, what do I do? Do they go ahead with the cast? Should we delay that? So it's a balance of, you know, obviously risks. You ask, well, talk to the team that needs the study. How important do we think it is? Do we think that we need to get the study now or this procedure now, or could it be delayed a few days so that they can have some degree of recovery? If we think that we need to progress with it, is it possible to, be, to do a study that has no contrast or minimal contrast, okay? CO2 bubble MRI, that's a good study to think about if you're trying to do a vascular procedure and you want to really try to avoid contrast and you're a patient that's on the border and you don't want to push them into ESRD, okay? Um, minimizing contrast and asking the radiology to really look at what type of contrast they're looking at, iso or hypoosmotic contrast, okay? And then if you need to go ahead with it, prophylaxis. So really the proven prophylaxis is staining and isotonic bicarbonate infusions beforehand, during, and for a short time after, plus or minus mucomis. So there's been big meta-analysis that poo-poo mucomis and say it's just the volume of the mucomis, but there have been very strong individual studies and some meta-analysis that show benefits. So as a group, <coughs> we still recommend prophylaxing with mucomis, partly because it doesn't have very many bad side effects, okay? And if they have high risk factors, you should give them the bigger dose, 1,200 milligrams twice a day rather than 600 twice a day. Okay. And then dialysis. So call your consultant right away if the patient is not making urine. Once you've confirmed, it's not obstructive. Okay. Because that's doubtless needs a nephrology to keep an eye on that person, whether they need dialysis or not. Okay. If they have acidosis, if they, if if they have acute kidney injury and it's not severe, try start your medical management, reassess. If it's not getting better, then call your consultant. Reassess though, please reassess. If you think it's a severe insult and they're gonna not do well, you can call us right away, that's fine. But reassessment is very important for these patients, okay? And anything that's refractory, acidosis that's refractory, hyperkalemia that's refractory, if you're having volume management issues, okay? Make sure you think about, does this patient have an access or do they have <coughs> difficult access? What are the potential access options? Are you failing access and maybe your dialysis consultant when they put in their vast cast could do a triple <coughs> lumen or, or a tri, sorry, not a triple lumen, a uh, trialysis catheter, which has an extra lumen for your nurse to use, <coughs> okay? If they have access issues, discuss it with the nephrologist because again, we can help with lab draws and antibiotic dosing for certain an medications. Um, does this patient have a toxic metabolite, a uremic toxin, or a drug that needs dialytic therapy, okay, even if they're still making some urine? <coughs> All right. So these of the studies that were done of in-hospital AKI <coughs> and community acquired, well, some of them obviously are only in the hospital, or the major risk factors for acute kidney injury, elderly, cardiac surgery or intervention, sepsis, ARDS, multi-organ failure, ICU. I don't think any of this is a surprise, okay? So I think I showed you the percentages at the beginning of pre versus intrinsic versus obstructive. Obstructive is very low down. Pre-renal is very high, followed pretty closely by APN or intrinsic renal. We don't really know if all of those are APN, okay? Um, so these are things to think about. Um, you know, sometimes it's difficult to separate pre-renal from APN or where you are. Sometimes you can have a mix. You could have pre-renal that has been persistent and now has progressed to patchy APN, okay? But they still could be pre-renal, all right? So again, history and looking through the chart, altered mentation, was there a reason for poor intake? Are they having ongoing losses? Do they have one big loss in surgery or a bleed, okay? Is it, is it pre-renal without volume loss? Is it because they have poor pump function, all right? Because in those cases, maybe the, what you need to do is adjust the pump function along with the kidney injury, okay? Increased vascular distribution, adrenal insufficiency, sepsis, shock, hepatorenal syndrome, <coughs> nephrosis. We recently had a patient that we were consulted on that came in, um, had some mild PKD, and came in and was diagnosed with um, 
liver cirrhosis of unknown etiology with decompensation, and acute kidney failure, probable hepatorenal syndrome. And looking back, we saw that this patient probably actually had necrotic syndrome even before the submission, months before, and was anisarchic from necrotic syndrome, not necessarily chronic liver failure. Okay? But to add on top of that, he also probably did have a very prerenal state, which we never figured that out, and we did treat him for hepatorenal. He did improve, whether it was the volume or not, I'm not sure. Okay, so sometimes, I'm, I guess I'm just mean to say that sometimes you can have what, more than one etiology for acute kidney failure. He also had an episode in the hospital of acute obstructive obstruction, so many different things on, at the same time. Um, and even if you don't have a pump function, you're not redistributing, one other thing to think about is that maybe you're having local poor flow through the renal artery for some reason, compartment syndrome, renal vasoconstriction with medications, rhabdo, early on in contrast exposure, okay? Um, compression, we've had some people in the Hemonc unit where they come in and they have had cancer and they have had radiation and they have restriction of the ureters because of fibrosis and they develop acute kidney failure with hydronephrosis, okay? Um, obstructive AKI, uh, it's pretty, you know, straightforward, a history, risk factors for obstruction, if they have a type 4 RTA, that's maybe suggestive that they have an obstructive process going on. If you have any doubt, go ahead and bladder scan them and put a Foley catheter in, okay? <coughs> Sometimes, even if the bladder is decompressed, they could have obstruction further up. So, um, you know, you might want to think about a kidney ultrasound, a complete kidney ultrasound, if you still can't find a reason for that. And then the bottom ones are more for kids. We have a lot of other types of obstructive injury, like posterior urethral valves and multi-level obstruction. Kidney stones, sometimes you can see obstruction, okay? And then how about differentiating? I think this is like a big question for you guys, for me even. Every time you approach, I approach a patient that has acute kidney injury, like what was the cause, what was the timing, pre, post, or intrinsic, okay? Um, and pre-renal separating from APN. So what do we normally use? BUN and creatinine ratio, urine osmolality, HENA, how do they systemically, how do they look, right? Do they look fluid overloaded? Do they look dehydrated? Do they have a history of dehydration? And then you have other sort of ways to assess it. Do they respond to volume? If you've adequately hydrated them and they don't have a renal artery constriction, they should start to urinate if they have, if it's pure pre-renal, okay? You can look at a CVP, you can look at the IVC collapsibility, those things can sometimes help you. Um, urinary indices, FINA, we're gonna just very briefly talk about cases. FINA is a very specific test. It only specifically helps you to differentiate whether the renal tubules are working correctly to concentrate urine and to secrete creatinine, okay? It does not help you to differentiate between tubular and uh, be between intrinsic causes like tubular and GN. Uh, sorry, because it, it's really just to tell you whether the two wheels are functioning. Okay, um, so you can look, you can have a pre-renal picture and it still can be intrinsic renal failure from glomerulonephritis because they can look pre-renal um, or tubulointerstitial nephritis from AIN that could look pre-renal or it could look like APN, depending on where you are with that injury, okay? If you're giving a lot of saline-containing fluids, you sometimes can muddy the picture of your FINA. Diuretics, again, the sensitivity of FINA, it's not great, even without diuretics. 78% sensitivity, 75% specificity. And if you add diuretics, you can see that it, it's not very helpful at all, 58% sensitivity, okay? Um, you can think about using the fractional excretion of urea in the setting of diuretics, but again, specificity is not very good with that either, okay? Um, what you can do is look at just sp certain specific markers. If you've got a urine sodium that is less than 10, that kidney is conserving, 
Okay, so those tubules are most likely intact. It would be very unusual to have APN and a urine sodium of less than 10, unless that was a mismeasurement. So you've got to think pre-renal in those cases. If it's greater than 40, hmm, you know, you're, you're not going to be sure, okay? If, if the tubules are concentrating your creatinine from the serum to the urine 40 times or more, those tubules are pretty intact, okay? So those measurements alone sometimes can help you. Um, if they have pre-existing CKD, again, FINA is not great because they adjust their sodium um, excretion for their decreased GFR that they already have. And so the FINAs usually are going to be above two anyway, so maybe around two to three. Now, if you have, still have a very, very high FINA, that still might be helpful, okay? Um, and urine microscopy. The time to do that is early on in the injury when they're still making urine and when they're in that initiation phase of tubular injury, because one thing when you're trying to differentiate is we're looking for the tubular casts. And unless you have ongoing injury, sometimes if you pass that initial phase and you're in the maintenance phase, you may not find them, even though they've had an APN injury, okay? Um, but there are other things that you can look for in urine microscopy. Lots and lots of white cells that are persistent. They might have um, bilirubin casts. Sometimes you can see crystals okay and those can kind of lead you potentially one way or the other or red blood cell casts and dysmorphic red cells which would change the game in a totally different direction okay um, i'm just going to focus now more just on apn because it's just not enough time to talk about everything um, we sort of talked about causes of apn ischemic hypoxic number one direct toxic injury from medication contrast okay osmotic injury some things with hyperosmolar injury, you can see that with some formulations of IVIG, most of that is no longer in use. Tubular congestion and obstruction. Sometimes that can happen if you've got a patient that is very, very fluid overloaded or with APN with local congestion in the kidney, okay? And then just to remind you some of the antibiotics, chemotherapy, heavy metals, okay? All right, so this is sort of trying to give you a little bit of a timeline. So you've, APN happens when your renal compensation cannot handle the injury, okay? Your failure of your comp compensatory mechanisms, you have an ischemic or hypoxic injury, okay? And then that then moves forward to become APN. And you could have re-injury at different stages and that could keep the cycle going, okay? Um, and you can either progress to tubular recovery, you could have some chronic injury, or you could go to ESRD. We used to say APN is a totally reversible uh, um, uh, problem, unlike when you have an MI or a stroke, that the tubular epithelium can recover. And indeed, they can recover, but it depends on the severity of the injury. And even with mild injury, we're finding that it's probable that even though the tubular epithelium recovers, Something is going on that's turning on inflammation, and inflammation is turning on downstream fibrosis. So there may not always be complete recovery. But if they had a AKI and they had quick and complete recovery early on, they have a better chance not to have something going on downstream, okay? So I think it depends on where you caught them. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the initiation and maintenance phases. So you get your injury, your ischemic injury with reperfusion injury sometimes. And what happens is that it actually affects the brush border and the polarity of the tubular epithelium. And when you lose that polarity, the channels in that brush border, they kind of come away. And so your sodium ATPase channels, they sort of fall away. And remember, the kidney is very metabolically active, especially that part that's in the medullary doing the concentrating, okay? in that thick ascending loop of Henry, lots and lots of energy. So it's very, very prone to ischemic injury. And in that medullary interstitium, it's already very low oxygen tension to begin with, 30 to 40 you know, millimeters. So you don't need a lot of hypotension to cause injury, okay? If it's very mild, it might just be that you have some loss of brush border polarity, that those um, uh, transporters fall away, you're not concentrating, so you build up some waste. And then if the injury goes away and you have early recovery, 
possibly you don't get too much um, apoptosis and necrosis and the cells that are not damaged proliferate and repopulate the polarity comes back and those might be the ones that have reversible where they had full recovery and they don't get very much scarring and don't progress so we that's the time that initiation phase that we really want to catch these people once we can figure out what to do with them to try to prevent further injury downstream if if they keep progressing we could see that more and more cells if it's a severe injury they can have a lot of sloughing of cells those cells fall off they stick into the intra to lumen you see that as calf coming out okay and also they can cause intralunal congestion and that can drop the urine output also okay and then you start to go into your maintenance phase where the kidney is trying to repair itself and actually it changes its gene expression they find that you know in that five to seven days after the injury the, the kidney starts to express genes that you see in developing kidneys they deep differentiate and they have more fibrous expression they have more adhesion factor expression uh, and then if you did not totally denude that basement basal lining of all epithelial cells the remaining healthy ones will proliferate and then they'll migrate and set up all along and then they'll recover they'll de-differentiate and re-differentiate and become normal epithelium and once that polarity is re-established they'll start functioning again so you know if it's very mild you could see recovery in three days even okay contrast which we think is a mild to moderate injury if they didn't have any you know other injury or pre-existing CKD usually recovery within five to seven days okay if they have a more moderate injury maybe a week to two weeks and if they have a severe injury or they're having ongoing injury sometimes that can take weeks we have had patients that had severe kidney failure ended up on dialysis for two weeks even you know six weeks or more uh, or eight weeks and they ended up recovering their kidney function it's very hard to though um, tell in those cases whether they are going to or not okay so we kind of talked about that um, and we talked about that oh just again in that maintenance and recovery phase we can re-injure the kidney so we just really want to be very careful with those patients okay we don't have very good therapy supportive therapy we've looked at a lot of different things dopamine nefertize um, Lenaldopam, I hope I'm saying that correctly, mannitol, and all of those actually can increase mortality and uh, have worse kidney outcomes. Le diuretics, diuretics can be useful because if you've got oliguric, AKI, sometimes you can, that can help you with um, volume management. Usually it's not effective if you have an oliguric AKI or anuric AKI. So if you're not making any urine or they're only making 50 cc's of urine, that's a done deal. They're not going to open up for a while, okay? But it does not um, change your outcomes. It's just a tool that you can use to help you with management. Um, and there was some data that looked at use of diuretics in contrast injury because the thought is you're flushing with saline and you could flush the kidneys also with LASIK. Um, but I think the majority of them showed that actually it could be more injurious to the kidney than helpful. So don't usually recommend that unless you're post your procedure and they're having volume issues okay so what do we need to do for the future for acute renal failure we need to maybe tailor our risk stratification because we saw depending on where in the hospital they are it can be very variable the outcomes so maybe we should have the cardiac risk stratification and in fact there is a cardiac risk stratification uh, versus like the general hospital versus ICU because that might help us. These patients are very different. Um, earlier detection methods, right, that initiation phase. Serum creatinine is not very sensitive. They've looked at a lot of different early biomarkers. NGAL, KIM-1, IL-18, those are the ones that have been most studied and looked at and there are different places that are trying to develop a panel of kidney injury markers just like we have a panel for cardiac injury troponin <coughs> cardiac markers which ones get high peak come down so that we can see exactly where they are in their injury um, and maybe do some prediction okay 
um, we need to improve our supportive therapies because that's all we have right now. And we really, really need therapies to ameliorate acute kidney injury, speed up that recovery, and prevent it to go into fibrosis. And so if you look really closely at that cycle of injury, you know, they're looking at things like uh, growth factors to try to help speed the proliferation and re, re uh, lining of the basement membrane. Um, I think did I, I take that slide out, sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry, got ahead of myself. So this is the panel that they're predicting. NGAL rises early and then comes down. HIM-1 rises a little later, so you can see where you are in terms of the injury. Okay. Uh, this was, I just wanted to show you that they have some um, types of risk, uh, patient-specific risk scoring. This was developed by Dr. Takar uh, in Cincinnati, one of my old mentors. Okay, and he has a nice score that you can use to predict whether this patient is going to have AKI and you need to pay more attention to that patient. Um, these are a few things that people are looking at but haven't really emerged yet. Okay, growth factors, vasoactive peptides, adhesion molecules, because we saw that NCAM, DCAM are important endothelial inhibitors, reactive oxygen scavengers to help prevent the reperfusion phase of injury. Okay, and then things that are expressed by the proximal and tubule, and uh, distal tubule that come out in the urine that potentially could help you to localize where the injury is. Okay. Uh, and supportive therapies. Actually, this is kind of exciting. There actually is somebody that's developing a wearable artificial mm -hmm. kidney. It's kind of like a camper pack that you go around in. Um, somebody that's working on an artificial bioimplantable kidney, both for PD and hemo, um, and uh, developing membranes that mimic the tubular action, not just the filter action of the kidney. And in fact, that membrane has been used in the um, ICU uh, in management of sepsis, and it showed very, very impressive results. Of course, this is one researcher in one study, and it was a fairly well done study. However, the membrane is super expensive and very hard, so it's not really, a, at this point, a usable therapy unless they find some way to mass produce it for cheap, okay? But that's very exciting for um, reversing sepsis, actually, in the um, ICU, and you can see sepsis patients in the ICU with sepsis, that's one of the main risk factors, and they have very high uh, relative risk of death. Okay, I think that's it. Um,